Good evening and welcome at the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure uh, to have a panel discussion uh, with uh, our audience here, but also with our audience on video, on the live stream, uh, on the situation of Myanmar, with the title Myanmar Today, the end or beginning of democracy. Uh, and uh, the special uh, honor is to have the Minister uh, for, um, of the National Unity Government for Human Rights and LGBT activist, uh, Mr. Ong Myo Min. Welcome to Vienna. Thank you. Uh, on our panel, we also have uh, Mr. Georg Bauer, who is uh, young but maybe already the best expert on Myanmar issues uh, at Austrian universities and he used to work also for the EU delegation to Myanmar. Welcome also. Thank you. Uh, and then we have one of our most experienced diplomats, uh, an, an, an outstanding multilateralist, Ambassador Christian Strohal, who uh, was our ambassador to the OSC, to UN in Geneva. He worked as director of, uh, for uh, ODIA, uh, and he is a board member of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Studies. Welcome, Christian. Okay. <laughs> and we have a very uh, specialized also moderator, uh, Alfred Gerstl. He's from the Department of Asian Studies of the Balatsky University of Olomouc, but it, as he's Austrian, as most of you know, and he's also a senior, senior advisor to the Austrian Institute for, for European and Security Studies. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's my pleasure. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would have loved to say we don't need such a discussion. Uh, but we need to uh, remind, I think, the world community about the fact that it's almost one year that the military coup happened in, in, in Myanmar. It certainly was not the first military coup, and our speaker tonight has an experience of goes back as far as the, as the military coup in 1988, I understand, when he was a student. Uh, and it is a situation where many people would say uh, uh, it is uh, not simply <laughs> one of the traditions of a country like Myanmar, but it is something that has to do a, a lot with the situation we are in a geopolitical situation we are living in. It has a lot to do with actually the fact what's going on, not in Myanmar itself, but uh, all around in, in the changing geopolitical field that we have. Uh, and why we as a diplomatic academy are happy to organize this is also because we feel that uh, Austria and Europe especially, uh, has some sort of obligation to not only discuss this matter, but to, to see where we can help and whether we are helping enough. Uh, Minister Ong Myo Min had already contacts in the Austrian parliament and in other fields, uh, and uh, uh, he is a po very polite man, but I am not so polite. I'm director of this, of this diplomatic academy. I can say we are not doing enough. Um, the European Union especially is in, not only in this case, mainly a loud speaker, not a loud actor. Uh, so it needs uh, to, to act also, and action means in the case of, of the military regime in Myanmar, discussing how can we help with sanctions, discussing whether arms embargoes are necessary, discussing uh, how we can get humanitarian aid, in the given situation into the country, but also helping them uh, to support all those legitimate uh, democratic forces that exist inside and outside of Myanmar. And let me say from what I know from the last year, uh, it is really different because the uh, reform forces, the democratic forces, are not only combined because of social media, much better than they used to be 20 or 30 years ago, but also there seems to be a chance that a lot of those ethnic groups, even the ethnic military groups in the country, are working together to make this democratic transition possible. That's the reason why we have in the title of tonight's panel also maybe the beginning of democracy, because this would be a very important step beyond whatever the military junta is doing for the future of Myanmar. You see a, a lot of important issues uh, to discuss, and I'm much looking forward uh, to, this, to the discussion, and I 
pass, pass the word now to the moderator to lead you through this evening. Welcome again from my side. Thank you very much, Ambassador Briggs, for the invitation and also for the introduction. And I'm really very happy to see the audience here in the room. Even so, the event is also live streamed. It's always a much more comfortable, nicer atmosphere if we have exchange, if we do see each other. Almost exactly one year ago, the military overthrew the democratically elected government of Myanmar. Afterwards, it arrested the leaders of the ruling party, especially of the, the National League for Democracy, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, civil society representatives, as well as ordinary citizens. In total, more than 11,000 people were arrested since the coup in February last year, and about 1,300 citizens were killed by the military or the police. However, so far, the junta was not able to consolidate its rule over the country. The reason is the widespread civil resistance. Currently, about 400,000 civil servants are on strike, making it very difficult for the regime to have effective control over the country. In addition, to defend communities from the military, young activists formed militia groups, armed themselves, and joined with ethnic minority armed groups in fighting the military. Elected members of the parliament went underground after the coup, and together with activists, civil society leaders, and representatives of various ethnic groups, appointed the National Unity Government, NUG. The NUG is currently building an administration, delivering services to citizens, communities, and is currently in the process of drafting a new constitution for the country. As mentioned by Ambassador Briggs, the international community condemned the coup. However, its influence on the military, on the developments in Myanmar are unfortunately very limited. In this panel, we aim to discuss the current situation in Myanmar, and especially the aims and role of the national unity government. In addition, we also want to address how the European Union, and Austria in particular, could contribute to creating peace and establishing democratic governance in Myanmar. I'm really, really grateful to the organizers, the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, but also the Austrian Institute for European and Security Studies, IES, to organize these events, this event and give us the opportunity to discuss the current situation in Myanmar. I'm especially grateful that next to me we have Minister Ong Mio Min. He is a human rights and LGBT rights activist. You studied and taught English in Myanmar in the very beginning. And unfortunately, after 1988, as, as also already mentioned, you had to flee the country. You moved to Thailand first. then. You moved to Columbia University, New York, where you studied human rights, then returned to, to Thailand. And it was only in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, that you were able to return to, to Myanmar, so after 25 years. In Myanmar, you founded the Human Rights Education Institute of, of Burma, and you became a strong voice for the promotion of human rights, and in particular, LGBT rights in Myanmar. Next to Minister Ong Myung, we have Georg Bauer. Also happy that, that you are here. You are a pre-doc researcher at the Department of History at the University of Vienna. Georg studied not only in Vienna, but also in Stockholm, Venice, and Galway in Ireland. And he holds a Master of Arts in Human Rights and Democratization. From 2018 until 2020, Georg worked for the EU delegation and the Australian Embassy in Myanmar concentrating on the peace process and human rights. Thereby, he also conducted research on historical narratives in Myanmar. Georg wrote recently several commentaries and also gave public presentations on the situation in Myanmar. On our right-hand side, we have Ambassador Dr. Christian Strohai. He's an 
very experienced Austrian diplomat with a long career in multilateral <coughs> institutions, and I just want to highlight a few of them because you have a very impressive CV. <laughs> Ambassador Strohel served as a permanent representative of Austria to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, and represented Austria at the United Nations in Geneva. There he held, among other positions, the position of chairman of the governing bodies of the International Organization of Migration and vice president of the Human Rights Council. From 2003 to 2008, he was director of the Office for Democratic Institution and Human Rights at the OSCE, and he was also director for human rights at the Austrian Foreign Ministry. Ambassador Strohal has studied law in Vienna, London and Geneva, and is currently a non-resident fellow at Liechtenstein Institute of, of Self-Determination at Princeton University. Important to emphasize is that he expresses his own opinion and not that of the Austrian Foreign Ministry. Last but not least, my name is Alfred Gerstl, and I'm really, really happy to be the moderator of this event today. I'm a specialist on international relations in the Indo-Pacific, but in particular on Southeast Asia. I'm currently associate professor at the Department of Asian Studies at Palatsky University in Olomouc, but I'm also lecturer and adjunct professor at the University of Vienna and senior advisor to the Austrian <coughs> Institute for European and Security Policy. Today, we will start with a brief presentation of Georg Bauer, <coughs> in which he will provide us more background information on the developments leading to the coup in Myanmar, the current situation in Myanmar, and the challenges the civil disobedience movement sorry, faces today. Afterwards, I'm really happy to give Minister Ang Myo Min the word, and he will inform us more about the specific task challenges daily work of the national unity government, and especially of your ministry, how it is dealing to try to improve the human rights situation, restore peace and democracy. As third speaker, we have Ambassador Struhal, and he will provide us his thoughts on how the international community, and also Austria, could deal, contribute to resolving the situation in Myanmar. Having said this, Afterwards, of course, we have time for a Q&A session, and this also applies to our online audience. So please feel free to pose questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I will see them, and I will share them with the panelists, and of course, also with you. So we hope to be as interactive as possible. And also just mentioning, the event is live streamed, so you can see us, and of course, the audience for us Please also feel free to take pictures of us, so that's not a problem. But I do kindly ask you to not take pictures of the audience due to security concerns. So thank you very much for this. So now, Georg, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alfred. Uh, thank you also, Ambassador Briggs and the Diplomatic Academy for giving us the opportunity to uh, bring this issue again on, on the table. I'm very happy to sit here, of course, with Ambassador Sohal, but most especially with Minister Aumio Min, who I have had the pleasure to meet already in Myanmar. He doesn't remember me from that time. I was <laughs> too small, <laughs> too young, but um, uh, he, he, he had a lasting impression already back then. Um, I might be the youngest on the panel, but uh, you will allow me as, a, as an historian that I will cover the most years in my opening statement. And I will give you an overview of the past year and the past 75 years. I promise not to go back more than that. Uh, starting with the past year, on February 1st, 2020, the new parliament that had been elected in the 2020 general elections was about to convene and form the second government led by the National League for Democracy of Aung San Suu Kyi. But before that could happen, in the early morning hours of February 1st, tanks were rolling on the streets of Myanmar yet again, and leading figures uh, of the NLD, but also activists, uh, dozens of activists that the military expected to resist their renewed takeover were um, detained. And uh, members of parliament-elect were detained in a, in a hotel that they were quarantining in uh, before the st start of the next session. 
The military proceeded to declare a state of emergency, and it's important here to point out that that was done unconstitutionally. It was even breaking their own military-drafted constitution because that can only be declared by the president, which they threatened um, uh, with a gun to his head that he should sign the order, and he refused in an important act of bravery. Uh, the reason the military gave for this was uh, that they claimed there had been voter fraud in the 2020 elections, but they had neither in the months prior nor until today offered any proof of such voter fraud. They proceeded to form the State Administration Council, the SAC or SAC, uh, under the leadership of the Commandant Chief Min Aung Lang and tried to take over the government after these 10 years of the so-called democratic transition. So this is the first part, um, why the first part of the title is, are we asking, is this the end of democracy in Myanmar? And now I go back to, to the 75 years because it was not the first coup and to understand the current situation is important to understand the previous ones as well. Uh, unfortunately, the modern history of Burma or Myanmar is a history of coups and military rule. And to understand that I go back to 1947, the last year of uh, British colonial rule, where uh, negotiations were taking place between the different ethnic groups. Myanmar is a country of uh, a plethora of ethnic groups, uh, over 100, and they, in very short, uh, agreed that they would gain independence together as a union uh, to, to get independence as one country on a federal basis, in a federal state, uh, to gain independence from the UK. Uh, famous, most famous agreement here is the Panglong Agreement of 1947, and this is central even now to the discussions in Myanmar. Uh, but these agreements were not kept, unfortunately, and Myanmar was turned into a unitary, very centralized state, and so many of these ethnic groups formed, uh, uh, formed what we now refer to as ethnic armed organizations, uh, some of which have thus been in rebellion against the central state for uh, over 70 years, such as the Karen National Union on the Thai Burma border. Uh, in 1962, after a brief, let's say, a bit more than a decade of parliamentary democracy, the then Prime Minister Unu uh, wanted to negotiate with leaders of the fe so-called federal movement about changing the constitution and forming and reforming Myanmar to the, into the federal state it was supposed to be. But that was unacceptable to a person called Ne Win, who was uh, the commander in chief of the armed forces of Burma at the time. And so he staged a coup d'etat because his vision uh, and the vision of the military until today is an ultra-nationalist vision very much focused on the largest ethnic group, the Bama, in the country. And they see federalism as a threat to the union of the country. So they staged a coup d'etat and uh, there is a bit of an Austrian connection here, if you allow me. Um, there is, they, they arrested uh, one of the leaders of the federal movement, Sao Cha Seng, who was married to an Austrian woman uh, Inge Sagent, uh, some of you might have seen the, I will not comment on the quality of the movie or book, uh, Twilight of a Burma, but uh, it's an interesting insight into, the, into this, the story at the time. So what I want to try to point out to you is that military rule in Myanmar is tightly connected to the question of the structure of the state. Uh, basically, is it a unitary centralized state of the nation state of the Bama with some adjacent minorities that happen to live there, or is it a federation of uh, several nations that decided to form a plurinational state. But it was not supposed to be, as I said, uh, the military coup d'etat in 1962 was followed by the Burmese way to socialism, which in very short devastated the country, and uh, 26 years later led to the uprising of 1988, which uh, Minister Mio was a part of as well, um, and where Aung San Suu Kyi for the first time takes uh, the lead of the democratic movement. Uh, thousands of people were brutally murdered at the time, um, and the, there were elections actually held in 1990 to everyone's surprise, but of course the military did not honor the results, but ignored them and ushered a new, uh, we call it a, not a military coup, you might be confused because the military was in power before, but it was, they nominally were civilian because they called themselves the Burma Socialist Program Party. Um, but uh, they changed the setup of the country again and uh, t uh, was ruled by a, a military junta in the 1990s and 2000s. In this time, they drafted a new constitution that is being used until today, officially, by, by the military. But it's important to remember that this constitution was not a compromise because the military 
ostensibly included some of the democratic opposition and some of the ethnic groups, but all their demands were completely ignored. Uh, and so this constitution of 2008, which led to the so-called democratic transition, was neither democratic nor federalist. And thus, the elections in 2010, the first ones held under this constitution, were also uh, severely rigged, and the military's proxy party, uh, the Un Union Solidarity and Development Party, um, got into power, uh, which basically meant that some of the generals changed their outfits into civilian ones and, and ruled the country ostensibly in a democratic manner. They did, however, initiate some reforms and an opening of the country that we hadn't seen in many, many decades. And in a 2012 by-elections to fill about 40 vacant seats in parliament, the National League for Democracy and Aung San Suu Kyi decided to take part and they won all but, I think, one of the seats at the time. They proceeded to win the 2015 general elections uh, with a massive majority, and the NOD actually takes over power. Um, however, it's important to remember that the Constitution guarantees the military 25% of seats in Parliament. So if you look at the Myanmar Parliament, you, you will see a quarter of the people in military uniforms. Imagine that with the Austrian Nationalrat um, would be a strange sight, I think. Um, they also get to appoint three of the key ministries, they have no civilian oversight, and they are additionally deeply entrenched in the economy of the country. The NLD, nevertheless, continued uh, some of the reforms started previously and set their own reforms, um, but they've also faced a lot of criticism. Most of you will probably have heard about the uh, mass atrocities committed against the Rohingya in 2016 and 17. Uh, for which they faced the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi faced a lot of international criticism, not so much at home. Um, and they were also criticized for lack of progress and freedom of speech. But nevertheless, they are still very popular in the country, of course. So they also won the 2020 elections, uh, uh, which brings me back to the coup in February last year, because the military could not believe that the, that the people still didn't like them. Weird, after over half a century of completely destroying the country. Um, and they again elected the NLD. So <clears throat> in order to, to get back their full power, which apparently they, they wanted to have, they staged the coup d'etat of, of 1st February. But the people of Myanmar did not accept that and almost immediately started to resist. And in the beginning, we saw mass protests, uh, which also made news in, in, in Europe. Uh, and importantly, we also saw the, the beginning of the civil disobedience movement, which essentially is a general strike in the uh, civil service of Myanmar, where about half of the country's civil servants, around 400,000 uh, of them, uh, refused to work under the military junta, uh, which is an incredibly important point because it prevents the military from actually taking control of state institutions in the country. You can't run a country without civil servants, right? Um, the military reacts to all of this with the only language that they know, brute force. They assassinated protesters, teenagers, some of them kids, uh, with snipers, deploying snipers in cities and killing people by shooting them into the, in their heads. And so until today, as uh, Alfred already mentioned, there are around 1,500 people that have been killed by the military, around 10,000 detained, many of whom have been tortured to death. As a reaction to that, the people took up arms um, to self-defend them, themselves and their communities from the military, to which the military, again, only responds with further violence in the usual way of massacring people, burning villages, raping women, and committing airstrikes against uh, civilian populations. But they have so far failed to achieve the goal of, of uh, terrorizing the uh, population into submission and are losing control by the day, which we can talk a bit more about in detail. And to get to the last part, um, on the political level, what happened after February 1st was that the members elect of parliament that were kept in this hotel, they actually swore themselves in into parliament to take up leg the legislative functions because they said this is an illegitimate coup. We are the legitimate parliament of Myanmar. They swore themselves in and they formed a committee of about 17 MPs that went under underground. Um, to, to represent the whole parliament and to continue the legislative work. And these then again uh, con continue to appoint the national unity government, of which Minister Mio is a, a member. 
Um, but this is not only the NOD. So we have the NOD, we have uh, another two ethnic parties in this committee, but we also have several of the uh, rebel groups that have been active in MIA for, so, for a long time that joined them, as well as civil society representatives like, uh, say, Aum Yo Min, um, and f thus calling it a national unity government. It's, it's substantially different from the past five years of, of uh, the government that was led by the National League for Democracy. Um, and as such, because they derive their uh, legitimacy from elections that Austria and the EU have recognized and have called to respect, um, have the legitimacy of, this, uh, of these elections and are thus the legitimate government of the Union of Myanmar. They importantly continued uh, to repeal the constitution that had been drafted by the military also and, and drafted a federal democracy charter. I, as I said before, this brings me a bit back to 1947, this is to solve uh, as a basis to first form a proper uh, unity amongst all the opposition forces, but also to create a basis to solve the conflict of the past 70 years. Um, and that has led to an opposition that is more united than at any point since 1947. Uh, and this goes down, we, we hear now I spoke about the top political level, but this goes down to the grassroots level. At protests on the countryside, uh, young uh, Burmese people are uh, holding courses in civic, uh, in, in political education, in federalism. These are things that had never been discussed in, uh, in rural central heartland uh, of, of Burma. So this is a, a substantial historical change. And this is why the second part of the title of today's panel is, is it the beginning of democracy? Because we see now extremely crucial steps. I mean, for, for many decades, the word federalism was forbidden to be used. It was not even, you couldn't even use it. Um, uh, not only you couldn't you use the name Aung San Suu Kyi, but you also couldn't use the, uh, the term federalism. So we have, a, we have a situation where these issues are being discussed in a sincere manner for the, for the first time. And I'm not trying to say that this is easily solvable, right? Um, this will take a long time, even if the revolution succeeds. But uh, the point is that um, as long as the military is there, there is not even a chance to talk about it and to solve these issues. And this is why, and this I will come to the end now, um, we should, this in, in all this misery that this coup has created for the people of Myanmar, also see the unintentional opportunity that it created. Um, because the transition that we had before probably could never have solved these issues that have been around in Myanmar for so long, and we see it didn't lead anywhere except to another military coup. Um, so I think it's, it's our duty um, to support the right side in this conflict, in this open conflict for state power in Myanmar, so that this country can finally get to the important and difficult task of, of solving its issues in a, in a democratic manner. And with this, um, I pass on to Minister Amyumin. Let me maybe, if I may tell please, this please, anecdote, please. Um, <laughs> he was already well introduced, but when I said in the beginning that they arrested a lot of uh, a lot of civil society activists to prevent um, to prevent resistance. They knocked on his door, of course, but uh, we are all lucky enough that uh, Sayamyo was in in India at the time, so they couldn't find him. Um, and this is the reason why the National Unity Government has a very competent human rights minister, and we can listen to him here today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Georg, for a really excellent overview about the very complex history of, of Myanmar. And Minister, I'm really looking forward to hear your statement. Thank Please. you. <laughs> thank you for everyone. And another thank you, Gion, for giving all the historical context. You, know, you, you remember everything more than me. <laughs> <laughs> that you a lot of you know, your study, that yeah. things like that. Um, and also, uh, i like to share my my greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She couldn't make it here due to the some kind of you know, travel, travel issues, and also the, the greeting from the people of Myanmar. I share my activities here on social media today, and uh, the, the, our friends were very pleased to see that you know, I was um, able to meet the, the Australian people, politicians, and parliamentarians today. So this, they said, you know, please, let the people know about what is going on in the country. Because, you know, the, we have a long history of people movement, 
but sometimes you know other important international affairs come up, so be, the Myanmar people don't want to be, get ignored or forgotten. So I like to you know convey the message from inside the country, and they. They, one of my friends quoted what Do Aung San Suu Kyi said before, when she was in the, and, under house arrest. She, mentioned, she said that, you know, use your liberty for us. So this is very, very uh, relevant here this time. The people inside the country are living under the fear of terror and facing every day-to-day -day, uh, violence by the military, and they don't have liberty to do and they don't have the, the chance to see what is going on and their message across the, the globe. So I, I'm, the, I'm not just a minister, but I'm the messenger as well to tell them what is going on and call for the, the, the possible intervention and support the movement of democracy and people of Myanmar. So I was mentioned several times and giving the history of my background. So I never thought myself to be um, in the cabinet or in the government. <laughs> My life is full of activist, activism. So like you mentioned, I was a student activist in 1988. So I, that was a coup. And I have to leave my country that I love a lot for my security and to continue my uh, democracy uh, movement. So I was uh, along the Thai Burma border. It is sad to leave the country and your, your loved one before, but I, you know, I got a chance to understand the human rights situation experienced by the many ethnic peoples. Like you mentioned about our long history of conflict between the military and the different ethnic groups, the ethnic peoples are the victims, or I would say survivors, of many forms of human rights violations from extrajudicial killing, the extraction of villages, sexual violence, and you know, a lot of you know, forced labor by the military. So I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to leave my country, but at the same time, I got a life experience of understanding the ethnic people's struggle, calling for federal union, and why they are you know, taking up arms to fight against the military because they want to defend themselves and they want to call for federal union that treat everyone in the country equally and of freedom to everyone. So that is my part. And also I'm thinking, you know, I, Austria, the Vienna is the one of my dream, dream city to come when I was along the border. <laughs> yeah, the reason, you know, <clears throat> that I, I did not learn human rights at my university. I learned English, English literature, so I enjoy Shakespeare's. <laughs> but you know, human rights is, came to my, to my life because this is lifelong experience I want to learn. But I got a chance to learn the first universal declaration of human rights in the middle of jungle, in the library set up by the, our friends. So this is the literature I read, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I, I read it, and then I really you know, understand, well, everything is in the declaration except not in Myanmar. <laughs> we have a not declaration of human rights, we have, we have of all violation of you know, human rights mentioned in UDHR. But you may remember that there's a United Nations Human Rights Conference in Vienna. And that's a you know, Vienna Conference Declaration of Human Rights. So I really want to come to Vienna and learn about the other human rights movement around the world and want to tell what was <coughs> going on inside the country. But I was, that time, I was very junior. So my senior you know, friend got a chance to you know, speak at the Vienna, so I missed the chance to enjoy. But this time, I'm lucky again. I came as a ministry, minister of the energy and meeting with the friends who are very you know, uh, supportive to us and good friends you know, who support me around. So very glad to be here again. So um, Gion mentioned about the why energy was set up. 
you know, and then I want, I want to start clearly saying that NUG is the legitimate government. We are not the, the like uh, the military who attempt to stage a coup and saying that they are the legitimate government, which is not true. That you mentioned about it, why it is legitimate. We are not the uh, government, you know, self-government. It is appointed, it is constituted, and it is responsible for committee of the representation, representation of, representative of the Piduloto, which is the mandated and the winner of the 2020 uh, elections. So we are the legitimate government. And we are also very interesting, like based on the learning of the history, we set up the NUG for the very significant you know, ideas and also the thinking about it. Because the country has a long history of conflict between the different ethnic groups and different you know, uh, denial of federal union. So our NUG, we compose with the different politicians and leader representative from the different ethnic groups and myself as a civil society. So this is very diverse. But we are in common, several things. One is we are committed to build the country as a future federal democratic union where we are you know, treated equally and respect the freedom non-discrimination for any reasons. And also we, we are committed to protect and promote and respect the human rights for all, regardless of religion, ethnicity, sex, and gender, and also sexual orientation. So this is clear. I'm the first Ministry of, Minister of Human Rights, and also my background with the the sexual orientation, gender identity. This is a clear indication that we all respect the, the universality and non-discrimination principle of human rights. And that one is, you know, we, we want to stop the military range of terror in the country. We understand how bad the country if the country is under the military. We have long experience of you know, under the military dictatorships, no freedom at all, a lot of violence and killing. So we want to stop that culture of military, but, and also stop the culture of impunity, but bringing the country back to the, you know, the building up the culture of human rights, that where the, the mutual respect, peace, love, and justice prevail. So that's all we come here. So, um, like I mentioned that this is a great composition of the people who are committed to work on the human rights, peace, and federal union. At the same time, you know, we are working together with the different important stakeholders of the country. We have a CRPH as the, you know, um, parliament, and also we have a national consultant, uh, national uh, National Unity Consultant Council, Council, NUCC, which is also composed with the different stakeholders, including CSOs, politicians, and the ethnic leaders. These are the guiding bodies for us, giving a pro, you know, political agenda, political guidelines, and then the, 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 you know, uh, the guiding bodies, how our future Burma would be. And so they are, this is the thing. And I'm very glad to inform you that, that NUCC is now organizing, conducting a people assembly to discuss about what is our future role and how the, our future federal union constitution would be and how to build country with, you know, in consultation with all the ethnic people. So we, make, we ensure the future federal democratic you know, union, pay respect to all ethnic people and how to bring peace and end the long, long time of, um, you know, conflict taking place in the country. So that is really significant. So I don't want to say that our, our government is uh, 
you know, um, self-appointed government. And I don't want to be said our government, the excite government, because I'm lucky enough I could mobilize because I was, I was able to get out from the country. But many of our ministers, our prime ministers, our uh, acting presidents are still inside the country. So we are not the outside government, we are the legitimate government. Most of the, our cabinet members are still inside the country, taking, sharing the responsibility of the thing. So um, the, I also don't want to be, say that the military is a military stage coup. They are, this is the attempt coup. They try to take the power and try to control the country. Like you, like you mentioned, they're not capable to run the country so far. I would say that because there's a lot of you know, peaceful demonstration by the many different strike leaders, young people on the street. You don't see the massive demonstration like last February, March, April, because you know, military used uh, very you know, enormous violence, killing, shooting on the street and put many people on the street. But Myanmar people never give up. They believe the peaceful demonstration, peaceful protests. They organize every day. And uh, we have we successfully organized a silent strike in last December 10, which is an international human rights day. So people stay at home, no movement outside, and that is a really you know, strong and very successful silent strike by the whole country, I would say that. The military, we are so scared so afraid of the silence, of the power of silence. So this on the, the February 1st, which is one year after the military coup, we have <coughs> organized another nationwide silent strike. This time, military tried to stop by making so many orders and restrictions. <coughs> They, they make a, you know, um, they change the telecommunication law and arresting people who are provoking or giving information about the silent strike could be arrested. And then they, they, they also order all shops must be open on this day. And if they, 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 they close the shop, shop owner will be arrested or license of the shop will be revoked. So they take all kinds of nonsense restriction because they're afraid of that, the power of silence. And they don't want to see that the whole nation is very human, united and committed to say no to the military. So this is the way they cannot, they cannot control, but they are afraid of the, peop the people movement this demonstration. And also, like you mentioned, the civil disobedient movement. It is more than half of the government servant, you know, tried the demonstration, and they refused to return to the ho re return to the offices, showing political defiance. So that make a lot of, you know, um, uh, problem to the military, who who want to normalize the situation and say the world that everything is business as usual, and many many of the people, including medical doctors and teachers and some of the, the government senior leaders were arrested because they refused to report to the things. So, but people still continue that. Many of them also you know, left to the liberated areas along the border of Thailand and India, continue and joining our movement, and some of them joining the, the People Defense Forces to, to show the support of that. So even the military is trying the best to control, it is very clear they're not capable to run the country or even win the heart of the people. People are so, you know, are dissatisfied with their, their military actions. So military make two mistakes of calculation. The first one, they thought, you know, the using the fraud accusation of the election, they could stage a coup. But, you know, it does not uh, say that people, the people inside the country listen to what they, their accusation. 
they know that the, their accusation is just an accusation. So they, the people you know, stood up together and fight for that. And second mistake, they miscalculation they made is if they use the power of weapons of violence, the people would be silent and no more opposition or no more protest. So they use a lot of you know, terrors and violence against the people. But instead of fear, what they got is people courage. People are very courage to continue the struggle for democracy because they now hate military and their, their military person for committing violence around the territories, around the families, the killing, shooting, and destroying of the things. So I would say that my ministry, as a ministry of Ministry for Human Rights, are working three areas of work as a minister for human rights. First is collecting the information of human rights violation by the military. So getting information from the people on the ground, who I witness, who know the situation and got the information, always sent to us as a contribution to our movement. And also, we have thousands of human rights cases from the people, witnesses. So the Ministry of Human Rights verify the cases and make a kind of you know, direct interview with the people, make sure that these are legally verified, can be used as a evidence for the future you know, legal actions. So this is one thing. Second thing, this is one of the reasons I'm here, to, get, to let the people know about what's going on in the country and the call for their, your action, individual action, action by your government, and global action and intervention to save Myanmar, to help Burmese people. So we are using our cases of human rights violation as the evidence these constitute more on the crime against humanity and possible war crime. So they, there should be accountabilities. There should be a justice for the people of Myanmar. So we are calling for the international attention and action to cut the military by providing weapons and military you know, assistance. So call for military arm embargo. This is the first call. Second call is to cut the financial incomes to the military. I would say that economic sanctions, which make benefit to the military from the, from the investment, from the, the business you are dealing with. So this is the second thing. And that one is your calling your government or the United Nations intervention to cut the culture of human rights because no, no accountable for the military yet. And our domestic legal system is not functioning. It is totally you know, cor corrupted and collapsed because of the military trying to control the judicial system. What we like to call is the international uh, judicial systems particularly uh, International Criminal Court, make sure all the crime against humanity, war crime, and genocide are taken into the legal case against the criminal of Myanmar. So that is uh, our, the reason I, I come here. And the third one is the, to mainstream human rights within the NUG. Because we have long history of you know, human rights situation like Rohingya and discrimination. So we need to re review the, our policies and make it better, you know, our policies and norms and you know, um, the program. That must be in line with the international um, humanitarian norms and you know, international standard. So my first job, after getting um, the offer or request in the cabinet is the development of their policy on Rohingya people. That's a, you know, Myanmar is known for discrimination and violence and crime against uh, Rohingya people in every um, 
every uh, meetings and every conference. So we learned it a lot. And so we have our range of policy saying that NUG noted and acknowledged the crimes by their military against the Rohingya people. And we called for justice and we committed. We will work for the justice of the Rohingya people and other ethnic people who were the survivors of a human rights violation for more than you know, five decades. And then we will review some of the, the existing law, which is discriminatory, particularly 1982 citizenship law, which is uh, one of the discriminatory law against the Rohingya people. So we were reviewed it, and we were taking, uh, taking out all the some kind of, you know, some part of the, the citizenship law, make sure that everyone in our territory will be treated equally and protected by law. And then we were, and another one is that we were coordinating and following up the son of the recommendation by the kind state, you know, um, the commissions, and the son of the important recommendation by the United Nations for the case of, you know, stop violence against Rohingya and other ethnic people in the country. So this is what I want to tell about my background, the history of the, the significant uh, the points of the NUG, the mission of my ministry. So I really like to uh, call your attention on the situation in Myanmar, and then we like to make some recommendations that you can do it here. So please support um, your government engagement with the NUG because we are the legitimate government. So engagement means uh, recon uh, like, you know, having a more diplomatic relations or direct support to the humanitarian ground and other technical support uh, through the NUG so we can work together uh, for practical programs of humanitarian assistance through the NUG and through the cross-border, you know, assistance. And also uh, using your your, your role at the UN, please support the, the stronger resolution on Myanmar, and also especially this coming uh, Human Rights Council session is very near. So we're going to uh, make a lot of uh, advocacy and lobby for recognition and also cooperation and some stronger you know, uh, human rights resolution calling for stop impunity of the crimes uh, taking place in their country. So we need your support. You need your, you know, the, your government cooperation and also working together with the very important forum at the regional, like EU, and also at the international, like the Human Rights Council and other UN bodies. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for your statement. And also suggesting some ideas how the international community, the EU, Austria, could support the NUG. May I ask the expert on, on your perception, how realistic are these legal means, are there other legal opportunities, political opportunities, how to support the legitimate government in Myanmar? Ambassador Strohl, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister, for being here and for sharing a podium, uh, allowing me to share a podium with you. Uh, you spoke about the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights, which I helped to organize. So we would we have met there <laughs> in 1993 here in Vienna. <laughs> yeah. And I mention this because this was a, a pivotal moment in the international human rights movement because... Uh, among many, for two things, maybe. One is that civil society was present as never before uh, at this conference and at the preparatory processes. And secondly, the uh, conference uh, resulted in creating the Office of a High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations. Uh, and this, this uh, changed the way in which uh, the UN system was dealing uh, and is being dealing with human rights from a deliberative to a, an operational 
uh, exercise. And I mention this also because the current High Commissioner, Michel Bachelet, a former uh, political prisoner and president of a Latin American country, just issued a statement um, uh, which is exactly sort of relating to what, what you, you have been saying. She said, the people in Myanmar have shown extraordinary courage and resilience. Now the international community must show its resolve to support them through concrete actions to end this crisis. You can't be more clearer than that. Uh, so, the, the, of course, uh, it's the people uh, which are at the center, and, and that is the starting point for all discussions of human rights, the individual human being. Uh, is at the center uh, of human rights and therefore at the center of political activity uh, relating uh, to human rights. And people suffer. People suffer terribly uh, in Myanmar. And, and we, we know this and we have, we have heard this. Uh, so uh, how to respond? Uh, and the first question, of course, is to assist instantly, to... to to have a humanitarian assistance on the ground for those in need. And that uh, the UN family, High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, UNICEF, World Food Program, the, the, the whole panoply of operational agencies of the UN uh, is, is quite active, uh, not only in Myanmar, but also uh, with regard to the refugees uh, in, 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 in neighboring country. Secondly, what you also have said, uh, to gather information, to actually know what is going on and to share this information uh, uh, systematically and, and on a global basis. Uh, and it is quite interesting how many mechanisms the UN have created to actually do this. Uh, first of all, there is a special rapporteur of the uh, Human Rights Council uh, who is collecting information and uh, reporting uh, regularly both to the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly in New York. And if, if, if one looks at his last report uh, to, to the General Assembly, uh, again, this is not diplomatic <coughs> language. It's very clear. It's very clear on, on uh, saying this report focuses on murders, torture, and detention of human rights defenders journalists, civil society members, and people from all walks of life who have opposed the junta. Uh, it continues uh, to say that if the domestic and international response to these acts uh, is not commensurate, uh, there is a danger for protracted, auth protracted authoritarianism, an even greater loss of life, a humanitarian disaster, and a failed state that is a threat not only to the people of Myanmar, but to the region and to the world. Uh, so this is the, the special rapporteur, which is an instrument to actually create the necessary political uh, will in the international community to pick up the points uh, he makes. We also have also responding to a point you, you have made on the, on the maybe more legal and uh, criminal law side, uh, an international investigative mechanism also created uh, by the Human Rights Council in, in, in Geneva, which has been active in systematically collecting uh, information and creating mat material for criminal cases. Uh, so that eventually, either at the national or international level, uh, these cases uh, can be pursued precisely to, to, to uh, respond also to your uh, point that impunity for what is, has, has been happening uh, in Myanmar uh, and impunity for the acts of, of, of violating uh, fundamental human rights has been going on for much too long. Uh, and that, uh, that crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, and uh, serious violations of human rights are being uh, pursued by the, by the uh, international community. There is a, 
also a case in front of the International Court of Justice. And there is also investigations undertaken by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. So in a way, the whole uh, instrumentarium of the international community uh, and, and the UN family is being uh, already activated and active uh, in uh, looking at human rights violations uh, in your country and seeing uh, what and when uh, can be done uh, about it. All this together obviously shows that there is, a, 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 there is very clear evidence that uh, systematic and severe human rights violations uh, continue. So there is no lack of knowledge. Uh, the evidence is there, the data are there, the, the information is there. Uh, the response is also, uh, I would argue, uh, picking up speed, uh, picking up speed uh, sort of with regard to, to your points uh, on sanctions. Uh, there are uh, targeted sanctions uh, in the, from the international community, the European Union, uh, has been uh, quite active in this and is, 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 is considering currently, as we speak, uh, uh, possible further, act, further, further sanctions uh, in, in, in this regard. There is also the response at the diplomatic level. That the, the, the Human Rights Council you have mentioned mm -hmm. uh, will meet again in, I think, a, a few weeks, uh, weeks' time uh, from now, four weeks from now, uh, and they will have three targeted, focused debates on Myanmar, uh, the basis for which will be a report from the Special Rapporteur, a report from the High Commissioner, and a report from the Secretary General. So there will be a lot of, uh, of, of light uh, uh, being sh shown at the, at, at the Human Rights Council out, onto the situation uh, in, in Myanmar. And there will be, uh, and we are already working on this, uh, with, with our partners in the European Union, again, a very strong resolution by the, by the pro uh, sort of proposed to the uh, Human Rights Council in the hope that this will again be able to, to, be, to find a broad support uh, by, by the international community. So, all this uh, to say that, that the, the, the military and the acts they are perpetrating, they cannot hide. They, they cannot hide uh, their accountability and they cannot hide the acts uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they are committing. And uh, in, in, in this regard, uh, to the question, what, what, what can be done next? I think we all are in it. We, there is, of course, first of all, a need to support international organizations to do their humanitarian work, to do their uh, their information uh, collecting work and, and, and their advocacy work vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the situation in, in, in Vienna. Uh, secondly, there is of course the, 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 the urgent need that governments take this work seriously and that governments uh, find the uh, appropriate uh, response. Uh, not only by, by, by supporting uh, humanitarian assistance, but also by supporting civil society more generally. Uh, 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 journalists, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, etc., uh, etc., et in, in, in order to, to contribute to this emerging uh, democratic uh, renouveau, if I can say so, uh, which you have been uh, describing. Uh, and certainly, and, and, and uh, through this, I think, uh, governments need to be made aware mm. that uh, the world is watching uh, their, their responses. <coughs> and certainly, civil society themselves, uh, in all of this, uh, contributing to uh, what is being uh, done by the various actors, by their own governments, and by uh, civil society organizations. So in, in this regard, and, and I conclude, I think, with this, uh, this event is an important event because it, it, it responds, it, it starts a response 
uh, to the question asked in the title. Uh, where, is, where is the beginning uh, of, of, of democracy? Uh, first of all, of course, it is with awareness uh, what, is, what is happening. Uh, democracy is never finished. There is no finished product called democracy. It's a process. It's an it's a ongoing and never-ending process. And uh, I think uh, uh, you have uh, gone there already quite a while, uh, a, a, as we have heard, a tedious way with lots of obstacles, lots of detours, lots of setbacks, uh, but recently picking up speed and and, and moving into a new quality of, of cooperation uh, also at the national level and of cooperating with the, with the international uh, community. So I think in, 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 in this regard and uh, with the complex and recently tragic history uh, which uh, Myanmar is having, uh, this is certainly a formidable challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is a challenge uh, which uh, needs, to, which in a way also calls for the engagement and the support of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador Stroy, for your insightful comments. I noticed that we already have quite an interesting debate going on, debate going on, on Facebook, so I have some questions. And I'm also sure the audience would like to ask some question to the minister or to the other panelists. However, before, you've seen how complicated the situation in Myanmar is. And therefore, I'm really, really happy that I have a colleague here from the Central European Institute of Asian Studies. It's a think tank I'm also affiliated. It, there are three branches. One is in Olomouc. The other one is in Bratislava. And the third one is in Vienna, represented by the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. And my colleagues there, in particular Kristina Kuronska, unfortunately cannot be here because she's on her way to Australia. <laughs> However, I have my colleague Nikola Meissnerova, and I would like to give you briefly the word to introduce the so-called Myanmar Coup Tracker. It's a really fascinating tool that the two colleagues have created. Nikola, please. My name is Nikola Meissnerova and I am the research assistant in Central European Institute of Asia Studies and I contribute to Myanmar Coup Tracker Initiative uh, in cooperation with uh, Dr. Kironska, who is unfortunately not here. Thanks. As well as Central European Institute of Asia Studies and Transparency International in Czech Republic. <laughs> the Myanmar Coup Tracker is a web page and it is dedicated to mapping key events uh, following the military coup. It is a open space ground source tool for anyone working on Myanmar, whether it is uh, in research, uh, policy or um, advocacy. It is a long-term uh, project and the entries are updated weekly. It is focusing uh, on uh, internal uh, policy in Myanmar, uh, economic issues, violence, uh, civil disobedient movement, international responses, and freedom of speech. It will be our pleasure uh, if the web page MyanmarCoopTracker.eu will be a um, prosperous source of the information. Thank you for the space and thank you for the evening. Thank you very much, Nicola. <laughs> of course, we would be very happy if you have a look at this source of information, but we would be really, really excited when we can shut down the website because it's not needed anymore. <laughs> so let's stay optimistic. But now, please use the opportunity to ask the panelists, in particular Minister Aung Myo Min, your questions. So whoever wants to go first. Rainer, I see you have interest. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, 
my name is Rainer. I'm also a lecturer at the University of Vienna. I have a question to Mr. Aung Myo Min. Um, uh, suppose that international pressure is not enough to convince the military government or the military junta to leave its, uh, uh, to hand over power. What role does also military interventions and the People's Defense Forces play actually? As I, I've read also online, they are also quite successful to making the life difficult for the military junta. Also, how does the energy cooperate with the People's Defense Forces and the other ethnic armed groups? And then maybe another question is to the more on the diplomatic side. What does the Austrian government prevent from recognizing the energy, or do they already recognize the energy at the moment? And if so, why not? Thank you. Thank and you. If, yeah, if I may add, because I see there's a very related question okay. posted by one of our visitors from the internet. And here she asked, is the Austrian government supporting the people of Myanmar from military oppression and killing? Okay, two questions. First question is that the, the people at the Francis movement. Yeah, you know, the, the, our, our spring revolution started very peacefully on the peaceful demonstration on the street. And you can see that, you know, many people hold the, the big word, you know, like, you know, UN, save us. And our two people, please, right to protection. Because this is a hope that the, the war, especially the UN, will come and save us. That's a great expectation of the, you know, some kind of military, you know, intervention to stop the, the, our military, you know, regime, you know, operation on, the, on Myanmar. But you can see that no, no, hope for that. All the expectation getting less and less. But on the other side, the military regime increased their violence by killing, by shooting, by banning all the village, villagers. You know, it's spilled over to across the country. So people start to use right to protection, R2P, by themselves, because they know that this is, they are the ones who can save their life, who can protect themselves. So in order, uh, uh, instead of expecting their, you know, others' international military intervention, they, they have a sense, we should protect ourselves. We should stop the military atrocities because people are dying every day, military indiscriminately shooting and burning the village. They, they lost their, all their patience and tolerance. That's why they started. So I also, you know, as a young people, myself in 1988, I went to the border and also I took up arms because this is the way to defense. And also that a lot of you know, people want to take revenge. So I understand how the feeling of the people. So this is a choice. And also uh, for NUG, we are making lots of different strategies. It's not one solution or one strategy to stop the things. We are using multi-dimension approach. We are working together with the people, for the people, by the people of demonstration, CDN movement, and providing humanitarian assistance and supporting the, the people movement inside. At the same time, you know, uh, there's a you know, mil military defensive working together with the ethnic people. I would not say we are the government providing every support. We need support. We need the understanding and collaboration with the ethnic and, and people because they have lots of you know, experience, a lot of you know, things that we can work together. So we are co coordinating with that group and also you know, uh, supporting as much as we could for that kind of the, uh, the defense forces. But at the same time, we, uh, as a Ministry of Human Rights, my responsibility is taking up arms is not a license to kill the people. It's justify this is the defensive war. So my ministry developed military code of conduct for the resolution, for the con code of conduct that apply and all the people should you know, oblique to respond. It is mainly based on the humanitarian ground and humanitarian law 
like a Geneva Convention and war of, you know, the law of war. And also especially mentioned about protection of civilians, particularly women, children, and, you know, follow the, all the Geneva, Geneva, uh, the, Geneva, uh, the Geneva Convention. So we justify people have the right to defend, but the, at the same time, you have a responsibility not to attack on the civilians and innocent people like the military regime did. So that is my first question. Second question, um, yeah, we, it's very hard <laughs> to answer the question. You know that, you know, and that we have a, meet, a different meeting, but it's not the, the Austrian government not recognized and not, you know, uh, in the right position to recognize the NUG as a government so far. I would say that there's a lot of reasons they give us. But you know, there's like many you know, countries um, have engaged with us as a government. You know, they would say that it's difficult, but you know, there's a many good diplomatic relations, recognition, NUG leadership, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Human Rights as a you know, government representative. So there's a many ways. I think maybe I understand that it's difficult to offer recognition, but many ways to engage and collaborate and co cooperate together. So that is my answer to the second, your qu second question. You can add more. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, quickly jump in very briefly? Because I'm, I'm not a minister, I'm not a diplomat. I can be a bit more frank. <laughs> <laughs> The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'll try to, to stay somewhat diplomatic. I think they could be better informed of what's going on. They could have a better analysis of what is going on, and they could care a bit more. Um, Myanmar is far away. We have no proper ties to the country. Uh, there are not going to be any massive refugee waves. So, yes, human rights, but human rights may be in the area that we care about, apparently. I'm sorry, my frustration of after a year might, might come, to, come through a bit. Um, but I, we, I understand, of course, the complications of, of recognizing a government that is still battling for full control in the country. Uh, but I think uh, it's a bit of um, it's a lack of interest, uh, not only from Austria, but even, I mean, other small countries have done much more. For example, if you take the Czech Republic, they have allowed uh, the national unity government to open a liaison office there. It doesn't have diplomatic status, but it's a first step, you know. Uh, we could engage that publicly, for example. Um, and, and show a bit more support and not just issue statements. Uh, it's, it's almost embarrassing, um, all these statements of concern that are coming in the past year because they have led to absolutely nothing. And the, the people in Myanmar are making fun of the United Nations and, and, and of Western countries. They are asking them, oh, I, are you okay? Because you're worrying all the time. You're so concerned. Is, are you feeling good? Um, so, you know, it's, we, we need to show some courage engage properly and, and talk, it's, we wouldn't be the first one. And, you know, the, the upside of, of Austria not having any proper interest in Myanmar, we also have nothing to lose. We don't even have an ambassador that it could be kicked out, you know. Um, so why don't we form a, a group of countries in, in Europe that goes a bit further than, than others have gone um, and, and establish at least some engagement uh, with the NUG? Mm. Well, I think I have to, to come into this. Uh, I, I understand your frustration, but I think it's, uh, it's in a way somewhat unfair for two reasons. One is I think the ministry, uh, I'm not speaking for the ministry, but the ministry knows. We all know what is going on. There is uh, Myanmar is being discussed within the European Union since a year on a very, very regular basis indeed. So uh, if you say... Uh, people don't know, I wouldn't agree with that. Uh, secondly, uh, on, on recognizing governments, I think that is uh, maybe an, an unsatisfactory answer, but uh, together with many other countries, uh, we do not recognize governments. Austria recognizes states, uh, and that is a very different uh, ballgame. So we do not engage in recognizing or not recognizing. So that sort of, this is a principle of international law, uh, which also means uh, there is no need to formally recognize the NUG as there is no recognition of the military uh, junta either. Uh, there is no recognition either way. We recognize Myanmar as a country, full stop. Uh, 
uh, and that is not preventing us from, uh, from uh, working with you, of course, not preventing us from inviting to the parliament, uh, inviting you to the foreign ministry, but it's not, uh, I, I see the frustration, but the, the act of recognition doesn't, doesn't happen. It's, it's, it's not part of the game, as it were, in, in international law. May Outside I? Latin America. <laughs> yeah, no, may, maybe I should have been a bit more precise. Uh, of course, it's being discussed um, in, in, on many levels. Uh, my, my point is more the analysis of the situation. I, th I think it feels a bit that uh, many diplomats around the world uh, sort of perceive that, okay, Myanmar is back to the 90s, and uh, that's the way we react to it, with slow sanctions from one after the other. But the point is that it's a very different situation. Now, we have a revolution going on, and I'm not using this term lightly. Uh, you have a whole country in upheaval. That's a momentum that is that is a short to midterm uh, length that we're talking about a few years. We're not talking about slow regime change that takes place over one or two decades. No, the Myanmar people are trying to get rid of this military now, and I think this and and there is a chance that they succeed. And I think this analysis has not really reached um, the levels, or pe or there is not enough. Um, will to actively support that. And the, the question of recognition, and I've heard many governments tell us that, um, that there is no official recognition. I invite everyone to go to Twitter and see what uh, back then Chancellor Sebastian Kurz wrote uh, three years ago about uh, Juan Guaido in Argentina, where it's suddenly we could change the long established um, uh, rule that we recognize states, not governments, where he threatened that he would. Um, recognize Guaido and then did recognize Guaido. And there is not only the Sebastian Kurz and the Austrian governments were not the only ones who did that. And, but, but even besides that, uh, there are, as, as you mentioned, there are, there are sort of implicit forms of recognition. Say uh, the, the current ambassador of Austria to Myanmar, which sits in, in, uh, in Thailand, uh, I think her term runs out next, uh, by the end of this year, so there will be a new ambassador. Who will she give the credentials to in Myanmar? That's a decision that we have to take. Who do we accept as the ambassador of Myanmar to Austria? Those are implicit forms of recognition where we have not taken the steps. Why are we not kicking out ambassadors? I'm trying to be a bit more radical here because I want to <laughs> on, on purpose. But, um, but, but why are we allowing, uh, why does Germany have a military attaché at the embassy in Germany? And then they complain about the military atrocities in, in, in Myanmar? You know, Again, you don't have to issue a press statement or a tweet saying who you recognize, but at least engage and, and build relations. And we've had almost a year uh, of the national unity government, and we've seen way too little of, of these implicit forms of, of recognition. If I just may add, in September last year, the European Union has issued its Indo-Pacific strategy. And if you have read it, it strategy is so keen on promoting human rights and democracy in the Indo-Pacific, and now we have a case of concern, mm -hmm. and what exactly is the EU doing? So that would be just my, my comment. But now back to you. So please, if you have questions, comments, feel free to do so. Please, yes. And so you will get the microphone from behind. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, Excellency, I want to ask you something. My name is Amma, a professor at Bratislava at Hamburg. And I want to ask you, I have uh, pointed out that uh, the people in Myanmar wanting to attend the school is about nine years. And the average of people with an age of 25 years is increasing from 2.4 in the year 1990 to 4.7 in the year 2015. Do you think that nine years is enough to understand human rights in your country? Well, human rights belongs to everyone and human rights education is very important. But uh, I would say that the methodology should be appropriate to the age. Now, we cannot just talking about human rights and international law at the age of nine. It is too much. But what the basis understanding of human rights, mutual respect, 
understanding the diversity and stop violence. You know, this kind of thing should be taught in the child-friendly way, appropriate methodology that could be used at night. So you can start your human rights, you know, uh, principle of human rights, even at the age of five. You know, in our Buddhist teaching, you know, that everything is much, very much related. Don't kill, don't steal, uh, don't make any adultery, and pay respect to the elder. So these are the principles of human rights. We've been teach, we've been taught since, you know, we, when we understand that kind of thing. So the human rights education does not have a, the age boundary, but language, methodologies, and your, you know, the way of engaging with engagement is more important. So I would say that in you know, the age of nine, it is okay to teach, but you, know, you use the appropriate way of teaching. Thank you. Then we have one, a couple of questions from the audience. I would like to read one from Etienne. And the question is, I would like to ask whether major humanitarian actors have met with the NUG. For example, the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross has met with senior commander Min Ong Yang. Have similar meetings been held with NUG humanitarian minister Win Myat? I, I didn't get it, sorry. The question is, are there any meetings between high-level representatives of international humanitarian actors, especially the, the Red Cross, with your okay. government? Um, not really, as far as I understand. There's no dialogue or uh, meeting with the humanitarian organization like ICRC or, you know, that other, other things so far. You know, okay. But there's uh, some, some INGOs, you know, discuss about the humanitarian you know, uh, especially the COVID, you know, mm. COVID situation with the, the, the military uh, regime. Mm -hmm. okay. Then I'll read another one from the online audience, from, from Dear. And the question, oops, the question is about China. So, <laughs> so back to international politics. The question is about if China and the military regime become even more closer, what will be the impact on the situation? China what? and military, military? China, and if China deepens its relations with the, with the junta, what consequences will it have for the country? That is the, the common question I received, the rule of China, the influence of Chinese over Myanmar. So the, the, we have a long you know, history of you know, relation yeah. Military to military relations and the closer relation with China and the regime for a long time. And also, China has a long history of business relations in the country. So, uh, I think it, uh, it depends on the intention of the relations. If the China wants to support the military for prolong the power, it is a big impact to them. But if China take a good, 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 of, good role of the, the situation in Myanmar, I think that is a great you know, alliance with the NUG and the democratic movement. So we are we, we concerned about the, 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 the diplomatic relations, but you know, I really welcome you know, the, good, the diplomatic you know, relations with good intention to solve the problem of current problem of Myanmar in peaceful way and more tangible and also more uh, practical way of solving the problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. again looking to the audience. Please, yes. Hello. I would have a question about the civil disobedience movement. How are they surviving? What is their situation? And how can they be supported? Because 400,000 uh, 400, people without the job for more than a year, what is their situation? Thank you for this question. Um, the NUG, uh, most of the, our expense, we, we actually, you know, our NUG government is, you know, receiving support from the people and the Burmese 
diaspora, diaspora, diaspora Burmese from exile. They supporting financially yeah. mainly. We don't have any you know, direct support from the government yet so far. Uh, so <clears throat> all the support from the Burmese people on the you know, overseas Burmese, we spent most of them for the CDN support to, to support their survivals and their life. You know, we, because they are, we, we, we have a different government, different, sorry, a different ministry. So ministry try to get the list of the CDM staff under their, under their ministry and support maxim, uh, minimum, you know, incomes for them. But it's not easy because involving in CDM is crime for military and also difficult to track down because they are not in one office anymore. They are spread, and also many of them decided to find, find you know, finding another job. But we, we try to make a list of the people who are stays on CDM, trying to use a different way to give that kind of management support for them. And, but interestingly, many CDM say that we will survive. Myanmar is the, the country where people are very resilient to cope with. We, we overcome even the Nagist, we overcome the long history of, you know, dictatorship, poverty, everything. So they said, you know, we, they can find a way to survive by themselves. You know, change their job, selling, that selling things and coming to other, other, uh, working other business. So even though we try, some people said they, they could find a way of survival themselves. This is very congratulatory. First, they took a risk. Second one, they are very resilient, you know, to find their own way to survive. Mm -hmm. And I could Please. quickly jump in here because I think it's also one of the avenues where international support could be useful. Uh, I think uh, from, from what I hear, most CDM families get 35 euros a month. That's even from Myanmar standards, very, very little. And as the as Minister Mio said, they, it's, it is tough, but they are very resilient. But if we want, uh, if we want to, to support democracy in Myanmar, if we, if we want that this is done in a peaceful way, why don't we you know, apply some realpolitik and fund these people? It's, it's, not, it's not huge, uh, the amounts that, that would be needed for this. And that would effectively help, the, because now, as the minister said, they have to allocate a lot of funds for this, just for people to survive. This would be a very effective way where, where we can play a constructive role if we have the political will and the courage to do that. Thanks, because I noticed there are a couple of questions, but even more comments by the online audience, talking especially about legal means, but I think that has been answered by, by you, Ambassador. So thanks for this shift to the, to the civil disobedience movement. There is one question concerning the Rohingya minority, and the question is, if your government succeeds, will control the country, will the Rohingyas be invited to return to Myanmar? I don't want to say if. <laughs> I will say when. <laughs> when. Very, good, very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> because I very strongly believe that, you know, the people power back to, the, to, to us. Not to us, I mean that NUG, but you know, civilian government. So when we have a you know, new government, um, it's already mentioned in our Rohingya policies. We will you know, um, welcome the Rohingya people in other countries for safe, dignified, and volunteer repatriation. This is what we, we, we say that. But that, 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 you know, that could should be a kind of, you know, proper and process. That's not discriminatory, you know, that the one. But it's, it's, we promise it, but it's very difficult to, con to implement it right away, you know, because of the military and, you know, we are not in the position of official repatriation. But very, I could promise and I could commit it that there, should, there would be a, volunteer, safe, and you know, dignified return for the people who, who, are, who were from Myanmar and now taking, in, taking refuge in other countries. 
Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you for this interesting discussion. Um, only a short question. Uh, now it's always uh, the military and the opposition or oppositional forces or rebel groups. What, how is the situation inside the military? Is it like acting as one or is there, are there traces of, of, of resistance inside the military? I mean, it's just the, the, the soldiers, they, they <coughs> come from somewhere. They are, they are also people from, from, from Myanmar. So how, how is the situation? Thank you. Yeah, we call, we always name military, but you know, there's a many, you know, groups, um, many people who are very loyal to military, but at the same time, the many people, soldiers especially, you know, frust getting frustrating for do the, do what's the military. One is, you know, it's very unequal benefit. You know, the, the soldiers, ordinary soldiers, are working as a slave without any freedom or any kinds of, you know, um, the, the independent, mean, you know, their right. But only the military leaders make all benefit, make their own incomes, and you know, make them and their family wealthy. So that's an unequal, you know, uh, division of benefits in the uh, in within the military. And second reason is, you know, uh, soldiers are forced to go to the front line, where there's a, a lot of attack by the civilians. So many people, many soldiers were killed. And it's, they don't want to go, and then they're not happy with the sign of the restriction, because many of the families are put into, in the barrack as like a hostage. So if the, the soldier I mean, join the other side, the, the, the whole family is subject to mistreat, mistreatment by the thing. So that kind of you know, policies make unhappy to the many, many soldiers. So, so far, since the military coup, we have about you know, 2,000 soldiers defected to ethnic areas, and many of them are taking refuge along the border under the control area for ethnic people. You can see that, you know, there's a disaffection. And then for ourselves, I think uh, we know that situation. So we always welcome the, the soldier who don't want to serve in the military anymore, who don't want to, you know, to commit their crimes ordered by the military anymore, we are welcoming them to try with us. And also, we also closely working together with the ethnic armed organization, how to treat them, how to, you know, give our, you know, necessary assistance. So we call, you know, um, the welcoming program for the soldiers. And then we have many, some of the, the soldiers also running this program, welcoming other people to try. And we grantee there must be a, you know, a, no punishment if they try, if they defect us. And then there we guarantee the safety where after they try the troops. So that we give that kind of promise and we, we prove that no one is taking action or some kind of thing, unless there's a, you know, there's a very recorded, you know, uh, atrocities committed recently towards them ethnic people. So that, that the program is running and we welcome that. Yeah, can I, mm -hmm. can I a, a quick addition, in addition to these defectors, what we also have is so-called watermelon soldiers, <laughs> which are called watermelon because they are on the outside, they are green, as in their uniforms that they are wearing, but on the inside they are red, the, 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 uh, the color of the National League for Democracy, so meaning that they are secretly supporting the revolution, but they are still staying inside the military. And I mean, we've seen bombs going off even in Nepido, uh, as the administrative capital of the country, which is basically a fort uh, of craziness built in the middle of the jungle where no one lives except for the military. A um, uh, bit of a short description, but anyway, so even in this fort, they, the, there have been bombs going off and, and the military has been attacked. So it shows that there are people inside the military that are working for the revolution. Of course, you don't hear too much about it because it's extremely dangerous um, to, to talk about it in detail because these people are um, in high danger of, of being even executed in the, in the worst case if the, if the generals find out.
Um, and we have even heard stories of, of soldiers paying their superiors not to be sent to the front line. So not because they, maybe they are supporters of the revolution, but because they know that they are under severe threat if they are being sent to the front line. So uh, I don't think that they, I mean, they are still, uh, that they are not dissolving yet, but you see uh, signs of, of, uh, of, of weakening and of them being stretched uh, very much across the, across the country. Thank you. Yes, please. Maybe I can speak like this. Um, hi, Mr. Aung Myon Min. It's very, it's very much a pleasure to meet you. I find it very courageous and heroic that despite having lived in different countries, you decided to go back to your own country and fight for it. So not many people uh, do that. So on that topic, what I wanted to ask you was um, what do, role do young people play in your country to um, deal with the current situation? And what role does technology play um, because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of t discussion about politics, but you haven't really shed light up uh, upon the young people. And is there a high immigration rate, for example? Um, because I personally, I don't know so much about Myanmar, but I do have some friends um, from Myanmar in Australia. But unfortunately, now they are Australian. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, what's your perception about that? And what can young people do to, to fight for, for their country, basically? Well, young people we call Generation Z. They play a very important role in this even this Supreme Revolution. You know, uh, I returned back my home after 22 years in exile. So my, the reasons I came, I came back is to, to suffer my country and work with the young generation. I want to build up their uh, culture of human rights and train the young people to be a new generation of human rights defenders. This is the reasons. I work, you know, I'm, my background is people known as a human rights advocate, but my passion is human rights educator. That, you know, I always deal with them. So I did lots of, you know, training with the young people using different, you know, method, method like a theater is a, one of the tools, and also film festival and, you know, uh, animation. We, I use a different creative and innovative route to re reach out to people. So I'm very glad to see the people, the people, young people, you know, they are very passionate for the freedom and dream about country with respect, full fundamental human rights. But sometimes, at the same time, I feel, you know, well, you know, this, this age, you know, it doesn't look serious. <laughs> they want to learn but they don't want to work on human rights. So usually my, you know, I, I always blame the young people playing TV game and, you know, lots of <laughs> game. But I, I, that shocked me when these people I underestimate now join the demonstration at the forefront, you know, call for the, the freedom and human rights. So I was, I underestimate they are strong commitment. I told them, I asked my, my, my students, how come you, know, you're not, you, you are so lazy to learn or read the books? <laughs> like my age, you know, I, I love reading, but they don't, they're not really reading. They just want to play. So I'm the new, one of my new generations, you know, uh, friend, you know, student told me that we don't want to lose our taste of democracy and human rights. Because in the last five years, under the, the civilian government, it's not perfect. But young people know what is the meaning of freedom of expression. They can say, they can use Facebook, they can even you know, talk about, criticize the government if something went wrong. So they know this is the freedom of you know, expression. And that's how, you know, many young people join the demonstration for student union cases. So they know that this is the freedom of, you know, assembly. So that they said, they, they know what is the taste, good taste of human rights in the past five years. They don't want to lose and go back my dark age anymore. Because we have no chance to talk, 
even, you know, anyone could be arrested, like right now, for seeing or writing a status on Facebook, or having a VPN <laughs> is now a crime. So that is that they, they know that it, when the military stage a coup or control the power country, their life, which is a limited, you know, taste of human rights, will go back to the dark age. So they don't want to lose it. They know the taste. That's why they're very committed, and they are much stronger. And also, in our age, like I would say, the 88 generation, we don't know how to use the social media. No chance to use it. And now people are, you, people are very friendly with the IT and social media, so they, they can get information, what is actually happening, and make them stronger, because they know, they witness how, people, how many people were killed and tortured, their friend were tortured to death. So that makes more committed and very strong for democracy. So I'm, I, whenever I met my, my students, I say, I apologize. <laughs> I, I make a wrong assumption that you're not interested, but now they are doing much, much creative and stronger than our generation. Thank you very much. Among my less popular duties as moderator is also to watch the, to keep an eye on, on the watch. <laughs> so there, is, there, is a, there are really, really many, many more questions online. We won't be able to, to answer all of them, but I try to combine a few of them. Minister, you already answered the question about China. However, China is not the only influential actor with influence on the military. So India was mentioned. Russia also tries to get a foothold. And of course, that's also my personal interest, the Association, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and certain members like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, who are critical about the, 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 the regime. I was wondering, have these governments contacts with your governments? And how do you see their influence on the military regime in Myanmar? Um, for our side, we welcome all, you know, as a government, we want to have a good relation with every country. Um, India, yes, because India is very um, neighboring countries, and also Obama is very strategic, like China, you know, between China and India. So we have a main kind of, you know, um, relation with the India and talk on the different issues, things like that. So India, because India care. Um, the policies and also geopolitically Myanmar is important, so that one. But Russia, we don't have, because this is not <laughs> the country always wanted to talk into mm -hmm. <laughs> the issues. The ASEAN, of course, you know, ASEAN, Myanmar is a, a partner, a member of the ASEAN. We've been engaging with the ASEAN for quite a long time as a civil society. So we, I work, I, we always try to put the Myanmar issue at the regional issue at the ASEAN. But in previous, no, no hope, because ASEAN is, you know, constructive engagement and having a, you know, um, consensus decision making and want to have a, you know, better relation. So it was not there until the military coup. So ASEAN taking a stronger role, raising the issue of Myanmar as a regional issue. Also ASEAN, of, uh, you know, show the, cons uh, the interest and intention to be part of the, the political solution by having a five points consensus that, you know, call for the military, stop violence, dialogue, and all these kind of conditions they set. And ASEAN has uh, the, the special invite for Myanmar, but it is not as a ASEAN as a whole. ASEAN uh, chair was Brunei. So Brunei appointed his minister as ASEAN envoy. Nothing happened because a lot of, you know, the military does not want to accept that kind of, you know, um, the intervention or pressure from the ASEAN. Now, the, this year chair is from Cambodia. So Cambodia, the Prime Minister visited to Myanmar, meeting uh, the main outline, 
in Nepido. Uh, he said, you know, it was okay, but we don't see that there's a good improvement or ways of recognition and implementation of five-point consensus. So ASEAN even trying to do this as much as they could, but no improvement or m m no kind of, you know, step-by-step -step development from, the, uh, from, from Myanmar. But one good thing for ASEAN in his standard is they did not invite Myanmar, you know, military leader to the summit. This is such a, you know, great, <laughs> you know, the action taken by ASEAN for their, their standard. So this is first thing. But um, because chair is Cambodia, Cambodia, you know, tried to have a bilateral recognition and inviting doing his chairmanship. So what we have, but it's not, ASEAN is become the crack. Some members, you know, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore on the other side, but Cambodia is on the other side. So, but we, we have some kind of, you know, re relation, especially the, the, through the UN envoy to Myanmar, which is a Malaysian uh, lady, a Sing sorry, Singapore lady, she is the special envoy. So we, we are have a, we having a regular meeting with her and we, we send a message across to the ASEAN members. Well, thank you very much, and I'm especially happy that we end on a positive, on an optimistic note, which is definitely important. So there is reason to be optimistic, and hopefully we can welcome you as minister of a government who truly controls Myanmar. So really, thank you very much, minister, for being here with us, sharing your view. Also, thanks a lot. Georg Bauer, thanks a lot, Christian Strohal, for being here with us on the panel. Also, a big thank you to the audience here for your interest, for your questions, also to the online audience. And the event was not only live streamed, but it was recorded and you can watch it. Please also recommend it to your friends, colleagues. And we are really happy to have another event on Myanmar in the better in during better times, of course. And thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>